Hey guys, I'm Mike, I'm an HR prof at the Ted Rogers School of Management. In weekly videos, I share my most challenging HR exam questions and how to ace them on the exam. So if you are in HR or have a big HR exam question coming up, hit subscribe, smash like, make sure the notification tab is on and check out my weekly videos. In this week's video, I'm gonna be talking about recruitment and selection. I'm gonna provide one recruitment question and one selection question. Here we go. All right, so for the first question, Recruitment question, you work at Canadian Tire as HR manager. Canadian Tire is in the process of opening a new online sales department to compete with Amazon. Compete with Amazon. This would never happen in real life. Canadian Tire competing with Amazon? No way. But as an HR professor, I can make whatever crazy scenario happen and students have to follow suit. So you're responsible for recruiting employees. Okay, so this is finally where it's saying something of importance. The rest of the non nonsense is useless, okay? So what are the steps in the recruitment process? Okay, so this is straightforward. So for me personally, what I highly recommend all of my students do is memorize processes. I hate the idea of memorizing definitions or memorizing anything in general. However, processes are pretty important because as a prof, if you understand the process, understand each of those steps, um, one, processes are an easy thing to ask on an exam. Uh, and two, if you understand the flow of things, Another easy thing to do is ask specifically about specific steps, specifically about specific steps in the process, okay? So we can dive into the process to make sure you understand it more. So as a baseline, I highly recommend you get the process. Okay, you understand that process. Okay, so what are the steps? So here it comes directly from the textbook. As you can see, it's a figure that I provided. High level, what it is, was when you're doing the recruitment process, one, you have to identify the, the jobs that you're actually hiring for. So that's more of an HR planning perspective, but how HR planning fuels into recruitment because it says what jobs you need coming in. The next important piece is once you have the jobs, you need to have their job description so you know how to advertise for them. Okay, so you know how to recruit for them, how to target certain areas and then attract try to attract people to apply for the jobs from there and then the next important piece is once you have what jobs you're gonna you're gonna recruit once you have the job descriptions associated with them are you gonna do this outside of the organization or inside there's certain pros there's certain uh, uh, pros and cons associated with each one uh, but which one are you gonna pick and then from there how do you actually go about doing it okay once you've selected internal external how do you actually go about recruiting those people so that was a Part B, your boss wants you to recruit externally, but you want to recruit internally, okay? So there's a little bit of a tension here. I, I like to do this tension. Uh, provide two advantage in uh, recruiting internally. Okay, so the one thing I want to highlight here is internally. There's a couple different ways, little nuances when you're reading this to read it. Um, I mentioned both of them here, but I want you to focus on internally. Sometimes I can throw people off by phrasing it in a way that's a little bit more challenging, a little more confusing. This is clear. Um, you're trying to convince your boss internally is the way to go. Two advantages, two disadvantages of it. Um, I'm going to just leave the advantages and disadvantages up while I'm talking. But essentially, uh, the advantages of recruiting from inside the organization, inside, is you, you already know the employees. You already know that there's a fit. Uh, you likely have other references or managers people have been dealing with. So you, you know this individual better. And, and you know that this organ that this individual fits with the organization, so they're less likely to leave, right? Like that's like the big benefit, right? And also from a cultural perspective, you can almost use it as like a benefit or a perk, because if your company is so used to promoting from within, and then employees know this and say, okay, if they wanna get ahead, they can use it as a career development perspective, they come into the organization, they can work their way up from there. The big disadvantage, when we're talking about uh, recruiting from inside the organization is that the, the generally the, the pool of qualified candidates is so much smaller because it's an organization versus like outside the organization. So uh, the pool is so much smaller. Uh, you don't know whether people are gonna fit because if they don't fit, if you have a difficult culture or a toxic culture, or it's not a very positive culture, or it's just a new organization or very demanding, you know, there might be a big tension, might be a big shift when people come into the organization, so they might decide to leave. Uh, also, when you're bringing somebody in, you might have to do some pretty heavy duty training. It really depends. Okay? It really depends on whether they have the skills that are needed, um, what skills you're specifically hiring for, but uh, those are some of the big uh, disadvantages when we're talking about recruiting from within, okay? And then part C, you convince your boss, good work. Okay, you convince their boss you should rec recruit internally, Describe two ways you may go about this. Okay, so in this case, so as you can see, question one, what's the process? Here's the process. Question two, internal or external is this specific step. And question three, or question C, 
uh, is really this one. How do you generate uh, people for this particular area? Okay. Uh, so in this case, we're pulling it directly from the textbook, or in my case, directly from my course slides. I'll start at the bottom. Skills inventory is, is like a big one. Think of it like a database. It's this idea that you're keeping track of each skill level or education associated with every single one of your employees so that if you're looking for a specific, if you're looking for an individual with a specific skill set, then you can go, go ahead and filter all the individuals with that particular skill set and see whether they can fit uh, the, the desired role, okay? HR records, again, you're looking for people that are available at a particular job level. Specific job level means they might be ready for a promotion if it's a promotional spot. Um, and then as well, this is how you, how would you actually recruit people? Why you maybe, you know, there's a job posting. You can, you know, back in the day, you slap a piece of paper against the wall when people were walking into the office and they could see it. Now those are more job postings are more sent out uh, through email, right? Typically there's an internal opportunity for employees to go for that job. If you can't find somebody in that, then you might go and spread it out external. Internal first and external. Pretty classic approach. Question two. So you work in talent acquisition at Tim Horton's head office. You were starting to interview, okay. So this gives you an indication we're talking about selection. Uh, as you learned in your previous HR class, while this wasn't very creative, uh, interviews are subject to many common errors, which may limit the, re the reliability and validity of the interview. So the reliability and validity, these are two very challenging tasks, which students, well, it's not really challenging, but students really struggle with these concepts. But I don't think I actually ask about them in this question, so you're off the hook, okay? Um, identify and describe four common interviewing mistakes. Um, so these are just things that people, you know, common mistakes people might have when they're interviewing you, okay? So it can be anything from uh, just poorly planning out the interview, trying to squeeze too many interviews in a particular day, not giving enough time for each interview, uh, rushing through the questions, right? That kind of idea. Snap judgments is when you, um, somebody walks in and they're not smiling and you're like, ah, oh, you're not happy. You don't want to be here. <laughs> you're not getting the job. And you just, you know, first impressions make a big impact, right? Like that's what this is all about. Uh, a negative emphasis, you can think about um, if I got a speeding ticket on my way into the interview as the interviewer, I'm going to be in a negative mood and everybody I interview, when I'm in this negative mood, I'm just going to cast with that dark shadow uh, and I'm going to look negative, negatively upon everything that they do. Okay. Uh, what's another one? Um, contrast error is kind of a cool one. Contrast error is when I'm comparing uh, candidate A to candidate B and comparing candidate B to candidate C, right? And you're just contrasting one person to the person that was immediately before them, right? That kind of idea. So you're, so you're not comparing them all holistically. You're only really comparing one-to-one, -one, right? Who it just happens to be before you, right? And this is a pretty negative error bias because if one person is good at math, really good at math, then, you know, supposedly the next person will be bad at math, relatively, even if they're like mediocre. Right, just because in comparison, um, they would be appear to be bad at math. In any case, um, that's another error, nonverbal. You know, this nonverbal one's a big one because it's like, it really depends on what you're doing, what the job is all about. If we're talking about a sales role where you're always in front of people, highly high customer interaction role, then they need to have positive body language and they need to always be in like very exciting, charismatic in your face. However, if I'm just gonna be coding and sitting at a computer this whole time, I probably don't need to be that charismatic or that talkative or even, you know, I could slouch my shoulders forward. It doesn't really matter because I'm not gonna be in front of the customer all the time. As long as I deliver my deliver and have a high task performance, that's all that matters. Leading, uh, kind of guiding people to a certain answer instead of letting them kind of find their own answer. Talking too much or talking too little. Yeah, similar to me bias. This is probably one of my favorite ones. It's based off this idea of a Russian doll model. Similar to me bias is the idea that I'm going to look for somebody to, you know, to hire somebody who's got traits similar to me. I have an ego. I think that I'm good at my role. So if somebody else is similar to me, then they're also likely to be good at that role. But it's bias because, you know, I have weaknesses as well. And over time, I'm just going to be uh, exaggerating the weaknesses, that particular weakness in the organization. Not cool. Okay, so any of those four will do. Uh, your superior suggests you should use a semi-structured interview transcript, okay, during the interview process. So this is 
this is the big thing here. Please explain why this is a good or bad idea. In this case, I actually show you the number of marks. Okay, each, each of my quest, short answer questions is worth 10. Each of my parts, I give you the marks for. Um, so explain why this is a good or bad idea. So for me, when I'm dividing this out, when you're, when you're answering this question, try to think, okay, how will these marks be distributed before I start writing? So defining this is probably worth one mark or two marks. And then explaining why it's a good or bad idea is probably worth one or two marks, okay? That helps you determine where you should spend most of your time when answering this question, okay? And what do I actually have here? I have two marks for defining and two marks for explanation, okay? That makes sense. So you don't need to spend uh, and write an entire essay on defining it or writing an entire essay on explaining it. You have to really just map out, put your effort where it should be, and you're more likely to get more marks for it. Um, so semi-structured, what is it? It's an interview transcript with predetermined set of questions, but the interview may go off the script uh, if something sparks their interest. The semi-structured is by far and large the most common form of interview approach, okay? Because you have a specific set of questions, but then based on the response to one question, the interviewer is allowed to create their own question right, and take additional notes. They wanna dive deeper into how somebody was responding or prompt them a little bit further. They can go, they can build on that idea, okay? But the idea is that you have that 10 set of questions that you're getting responses to so that it's easy to compare across interviewee because you have those 10. The additional questions you might add just gives you those little additional nuances that allow you to learn a little bit more about each individual candidate. However, those additional questions might be different for different candidates, depending on how people respond. Explain why this is a good or bad idea. It's a good idea. It is the most common form uh, of interview. Uh, so, by, so it should be a good form. So it should be the, the best idea that you're looking for. Uh, so in comparison to structured interviews, they're more flexible, less rigid. Yes, you can get more information, kind of what I was alluding to already. They also might be less rigorous and it can be more difficult to fairly compare, okay? So it's the idea that some people go and they, they take too much advantage of this flexibility and they'd ask too many different questions and they might not be able to get through all of those 10 prescribed questions. So if you take advantage of that flexibility too much, then you're losing the amount of questions that you can directly compare uh, across respondents. So it, it is a balance, okay? So you have those 10 firm ones that you should be asking regardless uh, to compare across respondent, but you can also ask those additional questions, gives you more flexibility to learn a little bit more about each individual candidate. All right, guys, that's it. That is my video on recruitment and selection. I hope you found those exam questions and solutions helpful. And again, if you are an exam, if you are an HR student or have a big HR exam coming up, hit subscribe, smash like, and check out my weekly HR exam videos to help you ace your next HR exam. Until next week, take care.